My name is Tim Reed. I'm an extension entomologist with Auburn University, and today I'm going to be talking about uh, scouting for insect pests or soybeans. The first uh, pests that I'm going to talk about on soybeans are cutworms. Cutworms cliff off the plants at the soil surface or just above the soil surface, and they burrow into the soil in the daytime and they come out uh, to feed at night. Sometimes they'll hide underneath the residue uh, that's between the rows and they are becoming more and more of a problem as we go to more and more cover crops during the winter prior to planting. The worm is a, a large greasy worm. It's going to be um, hard to see, as I said earlier, until you get to the point where you can uh, uh, scrape them up with a knife. The feeding damage that they do is typical, shown here, typically shown here with the uh, leaves that they've eaten on the corn plant. They'll also feed on cotton leaves, peanut leaves, and soybean leaves. On cotton, they can uh, notch the plant stem and maybe not eat all the way through it, as they did here. They can thin the stand over time. You'll start out with maybe a one to 2% stand loss the first couple of days after you, the plants start to come up. And then over time, you can get up to a 10, 20% or more uh, stand loss, so they'll get in your pocketbook very quick if you're not careful and allow them to get ahead of you. They are, they're in the fields feeding on vegetation uh, prior to planting, and that's why you really need to uh, consider using uh, a pyrethroid insecticide at the time you burn down, as well as at the time you plant if you're in a high risk area for um, cutworm damage. Thrips can also be a pest of soybeans. They are always present on soybeans, but they're, they don't do the same level of damage on soybeans that they do on cotton. You can uh, find this type of stippling effect sometimes. Um, they'll vector a soybean vein necrosis virus in North Alabama, and we have seen yield reductions in cage studies where we looked at uh, caging plants and not caging plants and keeping excluding the thrips from uh, feeding on the soybeans and vectoring that viral disease. They can crinkle up the leaves like this and require a treatment in some situations. You can sample uh, thrips by sh shaking the plants over a white surface like a notepad or a handkerchief. Another pest of seedling soybeans would be the immature wireworms, the immature stage of click beetles. They can feed on soybeans when they're germinating. Three-cornered alfalfa hoppers will girdle plants with their piercing, sucking mouth parts, and they can cause the plants to fall over later on. Uh, immature three-cornered alfalfa hoppers are very unusual looking, and you're not going to get them mixed up with anything else. They will also do the same type of girdling. They'll girdle the lateral branches, the main stems, and the leaf pedio. It is thought that the uh, girdling by these insects interferes with photosynthesis and the flow of nutrients to developing seed. You may not notice three-quart alfalfa hopper injury until you go out and sample your soybeans with a sweep net or drop cloth and you notice that the plants fall over. They'll fall over and you'll look and they'll have an even break, break uh, area looks like you took a chainsaw to it and cut a smooth surface, level surface cut. Um, sometimes the girdle will not be all the way around the plant enough for the plant to break off. It'll break off partially. Sometimes the feeding by the three-cornered alfalfa hoppers will lead to the formation of adventitious roots, as you see here. If you plant soybeans um, into a wheat cover crop, the current thinking is that you may have higher damage in that cover crop or that other crop of wheat that you planted the soybeans into than you would if you'd till that wheat up and planted. Uh, if you use a neonectinoid seed treatment on your soybeans, it will reduce the level of three-cornered alfalfa hopper damage that you see on those beans when you plant, um, plant into them. This work done in Mississippi indicated when they put two adult three-cornered alfalfa hoppers per plant on soy, cage soybeans, they had a higher level of girdled plants when they infested at the uh, three-inch height than they did at the 10-inch height, indicating that the girdling that they do when it's severe is going to start when the plants are very small. 
later work done in Mississippi uh, indicated that the adults were higher on the plants than the immatures, that the nymphs prefer stems, while the adults prefer petioles to feed on. And they did find that when they put three, three corned alfalfa hoppers per plant for one week, uh, they got a yield reduction in the greenhouse, but they didn't in the field studies. Three of three corn alfalfa hoppers recommended when the plant stand is being reduced below the recommended plant population. We don't really have a good threshold for seedling soybeans when we're sweeping. We don't have one that I'm aware of. For plant setting pods, the treatment threshold of two hoppers per sweeps is sometimes recommended. Recent research in Mississippi indicates that the threshold of two hoppers per sweep is probably too low. Significant yield losses due to hoppers are most likely to occur from feeding when the soybeans are less than 10 inches tall. And once pods begin to develop, you need to consider three corn alfalfa hopper numbers as a component of your pest complex when making treatment decisions. Lesser cornstalk borer larvae are going to be a problem in dry weather and sandy soils. They bore up and down the stems of, of the plants that they attack. The burrowing weakens the stems and causes the plants to fall over and die and the larvae wiggle violently when disturbed. They move in and out of plants, feeding. They'll go into these feeding tubes that they form by spinning silk, silk uh, webbing that will have soil particles attached to it. They burr up and down the plant. During wet weather, they can bur actually burr clean through the top of a 12-inch tall soybean plant and come out the top. Uh, this is the moss that you can uh, trap with pheromones. There's a model that was developed at Auburn University to help people use the pheromone traps and monitor the weather data to predict when lesser cornstalk borers are going to be an issue. You see this uh, soybean plant was killed by a lesser cornstalk borer that bored into the plant. These are feeding tubes on larger plants showing how big the tubes can actually get. And this is one way you can look, pull up plants and look for presence of lesser cornstalk bore larvae in your soybean field. Research that I did in Tifton, Georgia in the early 80s showed that uh, when we artificially infested small plots of soybeans with three corn alfalfa hoppers, excuse me, with lesser cornstalk borers, we could kill the uh, larvae better if we used Lord's band than if we did not. And where we used, uh, where we burned the wheat versus uh, not burning the wheat, we had lesser damage reduced in those plots. So if we did not burn the wheat, we had a significantly fewer kill plants than where we did burn the wheat. Burning a cover crop has been reported to increase the number of miles that move into uh, the field after it's then planted. It attracts the miles. Um, bean leaf beetles are a sporadic pest of soybeans in Alabama. They're not as serious a pest as they once were. They're different color phases. They can move into seeding soybeans and do quite a bit of damage, especially along field borders. This is the kind of feeding damage that they do. Once this damage gets to this level, I would certainly want to spray uh, my seeding soybeans for, for bean leaf beetles. Pod worms feed on the beans in the pod. They move up and down the plant. Uh, in the morning, they'll be up on high on the plant. As the temperatures warm up, they'll move down on the plant. Uh, this is a picture from soybeans that I took in August of 2016. The plants were in the bloom, the very early pod field stage, and the, the pod worms are actually feeding on the lush green foliage more so than they were on the blooms in the little pods. Economic thresholds vary from state to state. The economic threshold in Arkansas on 38 inch rows is four per three row feet, three per, three per row foot in, uh, excuse me, it's four per row foot on 38 inch rows, three per row foot on 30 inch rows, and they reduce the threshold to a lower level in a drought stress situations. In Mississippi, threshold for pod worms is three per row foot for the drop cloth sample and nine per 25 sweeps with the sweep net. In Mississippi, they also have a dynamic threshold that varies with the price of soybeans and the cost of control. In Alabama, based on the research done by Dr. Ron Smith, uh, we have a uh, just data that showed us that we lost three quarters of a bushel per acre for each infested larva per row foot. So the value of that would be $7.30 with beans at $10 per bushel. Uh, that's about a 2.2% 2 .2 yield loss per infested larva per row foot. 
if you do the math with a 38 inch row spacing, it takes a loss of 5.2 seed per row foot to result in a yield loss of a half bushel per acre. That's $5 worth of soybeans at $10 a bushel beans. A single pod worm is gonna do more damage than this. So on pod worms in Alabama, the treatment threshold is one per row foot or three for 15 sweets between blooming and pod maturity. The smaller the pod, the more pods a single pod worm will damage. When you're sampling soybeans, remember that a drop cost sample is gonna capture about two thirds of the larvae that are actually present with respect to corn earworms. Uh, it's gonna be a conversion factor. When you, if you've got three per row foot on a drop cloth, you can ex expect a sweep net sample to pick up 19 for 25 sweeps. Thomas and his uh, researchers did some good work in Missouri in the early 70s where they simulated defoliation at four different levels and depotting at four different levels at different stages of soybean development. In these studies, the control yields were always between 40 and 45 bushels per acre. If we look at the bar charts here where we have uh, depotting and defoliation axes, we see that where we had 33% defoliation and no depotting, we had a 15% yield loss. With 100% depotting and no defoliation, we had a 5% yield loss when pods were in the R3 stage of development. If we go to the R5 stage of development, the same levels of defoliation and, and depotting cause more damage. With 33% defoliation and no depotting, we get 25% yield loss. With 100% depotting and no defoliation, we get a 70% yield loss. Green stink bugs and other stink bugs are long-lived insects that can cause a lot of damage to your crops. The adults can live for two months. The immature stage takes 30 days to go through five instars. The eggs hatch in the summer in, uh, in about five days, and there are a lot of eggs in the egg masses. The green stink bug eggs will start out green, and then before they hatch, they'll be kind of a pinkish color. The immature stages of the stink bug, they tend to congregate together to maximize the benefit of the odor they produce that protects them from predation, wards off predators. If we look at the green stink bug, the immature stage has orange shoulders. There's a southern green stink bug adult, and then the immature stage of the southern green stink bug has a pink margin that sets, separates it from the green stink bug immature. If you look at green and southern green stink bug, you'll notice that the scent glands are elongated on the green stink bug, and they're not as elongated on the southern green stink bug. Brown stink bug is a common pest of soybeans and other row crops. This is the way it looks. This is an immature brown stink bug. They're more difficult to kill than the green stink bugs. Rice stink bug. Red banded stink bug is becoming a more serious pest in Alabama. It's, it's harder to kill than other stink bugs. It has a relatively large proboscis and it can feed on larger soybeans. It's harder to, uh, to kill, but also because it moves lower down on the plant than some other stink bugs do. Red banded stink bug lays its uh, eggs in two rows. We see those here. Um, the immature stage, as it hatches, it's a pretty red color. Red banded stink bug is similar to the red shoulder stink bug. Uh, it differs from the red banded by having an abdominal, it differs from the red shoulder because it has an abdominal spine. Red shoulder stink bug does not have an abdominal spine. It's a little bit shorter stink bug. These are the early instars of the red shoulder stink bug. It has kind of a zebra stripe appearance. Brown marmorated stink bug is becoming established in Alabama. Uh, we continue to find it in more and more counties every year. The immature stage is, is shown here in the picture. It walks kind of on its tiptoes when it's out in the field. It's easily distinguished from other immature stink bugs. This slide shows the relative sizes of different stink bugs. The bottom left-hand corner is the brown marmorated stink bug. Above it is the uh, predaceous stink bug, Podesis maculaventris, with the pointed shoulders. The second stink bug from the left in the picture is the red banded stink bug. Third, the uh, third stink bug from the left on the top is the red shoulder stink bug. Next to the brown marmorated stink bug, the first stink bug on the bottom on the left is the brown stink bug, it's the second stink bug, and then you got uh, a stink bug that feeds on trees on the very bottom right-hand corner. 
Sea bug economic injury levels, except for red banded, balloon to mid pod field, we have one per three row feet or two per 15 sweeps. Mid pod field to maturity, one per row foot or three per 15 sweeps. For the red banded stink bug, the treatment threshold is one per three row feet or two per 15 sweeps. Um, kudzu bug is now in its, it's about the fifth year that we've had this pest uh, across the state. It has not been an extremely serious pest during the last two years because of the Bavaria fungus and the parasitic wasps that have reduced the populations. Initially, we thought that this was gonna be a very serious pest as they would cover the, uh, the main stem of seedling soybeans pretty early in the growing season. They reduced uh, the number of pods per plant, the number of seeds per pod, and they reduced seed size, and they reduced yields about 20% in our studies at Prattville Station for two years in a row and then the populations declined due to the fungus and the parasitic wasp. This is the immature stage. It's flat bodied and a very hairy insect. The eggs are laid in two rows. Parasitic wasp will lay its egg in the row, uh, lay its egg inside that egg and then it will, uh, it will kill the immature kudzu bug as it tries to develop. Economic threshold for kudzu bug prior to first bloom, treat when there is an average of five kudzu bugs per plant for the whole field. After first bloom through R6, apply insecticide when the sweep net catches 10 adults per sweep, or you have one or more nymph per sweep. Talk about now the caterpillar pest of soybeans. The soybean looper is the most difficult to control caterpillar in soybeans. It starts usually in the lower part of the plant and the larvae move up. It's it's uh, It will stick to your pants legs when you walk out in the field and you'll bring them out with uh, with you when you come out of the field. Our foliage feeders have a defoliation threshold prior to bloom of 35%. It's a 20% defoliation threshold from pod set to maturity. You need to treat prior to 20% leaf loss when you have five to eight loopers or vetving caterpillars that are a quarter of an inch long or longer per foot of row. Or you can treat when you catch an average of 1.5 worms per sweep. Since loopers are harder to dislodge you count them twice and this is per sweep across two rows you need to make sure before you go out into the field that you calibrate your your mind to be able to recognize a 20 percent defoliation level this slide here shows different defoliation levels and you can see that 20 percent defoliation to me it looks like a, a heavier level of defoliation than 20 percent you can distinguish caterpillars by their abdominal proleg number uh, the, the abdominal prolegs are in the middle part of the body. Green clover worm has three abdominal prolegs. Elvin caterpillar has four abdominal prolegs. Pod worm has four abdominal prolegs. Fall army worm has four abdominal prolegs, and it also has fewer CT or hairs on its back than a, than a pod worm has. It's a slicker backed uh, caterpillar. There are many color phases of falls and, and, uh, pod worms, especially pod worms, and so you can't use color to tell them apart. Of uh, caterpillar treatment options, we can control all the caterpillars that are, attack soybeans easily with pyrethroids, and we can get 30 plus days residual control uh, on, on caterpillars, except for loopers, uh, with, uh, with the pyrethroids. The products that are preferred for soybean looper control are Prevathon, Intrepid, Intrepid Edge, and Besiege. You can have severe defoliation in your soybean fields in some situations. If you don't keep them checked, they can totally denude the field. Uh, bean leaf beetles can feed on soybean pods and they can graze through the pod and allow water to get into the pod and rot the beans. Mexican bean beetle can also feed on foliage. Uh, blister beetles are uh, present in soybean fields, usually they're clumped in, in spots in the field. It can be in very large numbers, maybe a half acre or so. And they, they can be difficult to, to get to, especially in uh, narrow soybeans to where you can actually find them. You may want to use binoculars, look across the field to find the spots where these insects are defoliating your soybeans. Yeah, blister beetles can cause blisters uh, so you don't want to let them get on your 
they have cantharidin, which is a toxic substance that can be very harmful to horses when they eat them in the hay. Remember that when you plant late planted beans, double crop beans, you're going to have a lot of different kinds of insects present. You may have sub threshold levels of these insect presence and as present, it's going to be very difficult for you to make treatment decisions sometimes with these low levels present, but having many different species. And I will close with that. I hope you enjoyed the presentation and we'll be back again soon. I hope.